So we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Center for Medical Humanities and Ethics. And we're looking back on ways in which the humanities and ethics and service learning and global health can impact doctors in training and help them be more engaged with their communities and also help them in their own professional identity formation. So Eitan, can you maybe tell us a little bit about how you came to be associated with the center? I know you've been very active. What drew you towards the people and towards the place? And uh, what sort of things did you get to engage in? I started medical school here in uh, the fall of 2013. And I remember the very first week when we had our orientation, there was like a, every club, you know, a student organization had a, like a, a little stand. And I remember uh, approaching Frontera de Salud, which is sponsored by the Center for Medical Humanities and Ethics. And it's an organization that does uh, community outreach here in San Antonio and in South Texas, mainly for uh, like the low income Hispanic communities. I used to be a bilingual elementary school teacher and I love teaching and uh, working with uh, the Hispanic community is, is a passion of mine. And I decided, well, that sounds like a great idea. And within the first week, I went on a trip down to Laredo uh, with my new white coat, not knowing any medicine. Uh, so that was nerve wracking, but that's, I got hooked this, that very first week of medical school. And um, eventually I became president of the organization. I taught medical Spanish for five years, even throughout my PhD years. I was involved in a global health project in Ecuador. Um, I even uh, collaborated with uh, one of the medical humanities professors at UTSA and gave a lecture on the neuroethics of metabolic syndrome. Uh, so I've been very involved with the Center for Medical Humanities. So wow, it was a, it was a trip to the valley that, <laughs> that really got you started. And it drew on several of your passions. You, um, you were a teacher before going into medical school. Mm -hmm and you continue to teach as a medical student. Can you say a little bit more about uh, why you chose to do that as a medical student? I felt very passionate about making sure that my fellow students had some grasp of the Spanish language, especially in a top Hispanic serving institute that is UT Health. And especially because a very large proportion of our population are Spanish only speakers. Even if it's just teaching fellow medical students to introduce themselves in Spanish, to even begin an interaction in Spanish would diffuse a very tense situation between two people who speak different languages. And that's something that I really uh, I believed in. It makes me think about uh, a couple of things related to professionalism, because professionalism is about how we rise to this station that society has created for us. Every privilege that we have is something that is given to us as physicians, right? This white coat is something we step into. The licenses that we get are authorized. And that privilege requires that we find this internal motivation. And what I hear about Frontera de Salud and what I hear about your efforts in teaching medical Spanish is that you're stepping into a space where there is a need. There's a perceived need, right? Thinking about people in their heart and wanting to find a way to connect with them in their heart means that as a professional we have to think beyond the technical aspects right of learning about which medication to prescribe for hypertension we also have to think about how can we empower people to make decisions that are in line with their own values that support their family and their community and so that's powerful to me that one of the first sort of um, entree experiences you had is with a club of other motivated medical students sponsored by the Center for Medical Humanities and Ethics going afar, leaving campus to meet people where they are. I want to give Matthew a chance to talk, talk a little bit about um, some of the activities that uh, you've experienced as a resident, one of which you both have participated in, and that's Ethics Report, which is um, a monthly session that I help facilitate, but it's really, it's led by, by you all. It's a case-based session for presenting difficult cases, um, illustrative of difficult themes, challenges that you experience as residents, and that we sort of debrief together in a shared space. You know, in no way of professional conduct could you separate the practice of neurology from the practice of medical ethics. You know, our specialty is, I would argue, uniquely situated in a place where we face um, ethical dilemmas in every single patient that we're treating. You know, from the obvious situations where 
We have patients who are on ventilators with neurological conditions in which the prognosis is unclear. We have families who can't make a consensus decision about problems to more simple things where we have patients in our MS clinic who have gotten diagnosis like neuromyelitis optica and the cheapest FDA approved therapy for that is over a million dollars a year. <laughs> right? And so how do you decide who to treat? And you know, we have a lot of patients who are unfunded that we treat here at our clinic because we're a county hospital and we obviously advocate for treating every single one of them. But you know, you can't separate that from the underlying discussion, underlying thought of, you know, equity and fair delivery of healthcare. I love knowing that our residents um, emerge into this role of being a practicing physician. Uh, pretty, pretty soon you're going to go out into that world as an academic neurologist or a private practice neurologist or perhaps some leadership position in advocacy and policy and administration and academics and you are developing your own professional identity. If we only talk about the technical aspects of medicine and residency then we are not addressing the moral imagination that each of you has.